My name is Raul Gomez. I'm a student at Mary College. I'm a member of the Althusser Club, and I'm a Puentista as well. Today, it is a great honor to present you to Ruben Elias Cañedo, who has contributed to the community as a coordinator of research and mobilization for the Centers for Educational Equity and Excellence at UC Berkeley. A first-generation college graduate student from UC Berkeley, Ruben Cañedo was born in Mexicali, Mexico and raised in the borders, valleys of Coachella and Imperial in the United States. He was part of a mixed status family throughout his childhood. Programs such as AVID, MESA, FLAME, Junior Statesman of America, Educational Opportunity Program, and the McNair Scholars Program helped to develop the problem his current position at UC Berkeley. Today, he facilitates statewide and national efforts to transform higher education by increasing the graduation and representation of historically underrepresented students, faculty, and administrators. In the last three years, Ruben has devoted his time to present educational, motivational speech and keynote address across K-12 schools, community college, universities, and nonprofit organizations. Like our greatest American farm worker, labor leader, and civil rights activist, Cesar Chavez, Ruben fights for the unrepresented, the oppressed, and the marginalized who seek basic human rights. Fighting for the cause by serving the community and helping people to reach their educational dreams, Ruben's passionate dedication to serve people is priceless. Today, we are honored with the presence of one of those persons who lives to serve others who need guidance who can teach us how to deal with the day-by-day -day challenge of being in school, always with his compassion, sympathy, and humility. Today, we are honored with his presence at our ninth annual Cesar Chavez celebration, Que Viva La Causa. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a real honor for me to introduce you to Ruben Elias Cañedo. On my, on my drive up here, I was, I was just seeing this. This is my first time here, by the way. I've never been on this college campus before. Um, and it was gorgeous, man. Like, you know, I, I was going through like my head. I was like, man, I'm about to go be in the space. Let me bring like love. Let me bring energy. And then I started, I looked up and it was like green and blue. And like the bay was behind me. And I was like, whoa, I'm not in the border anymore. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about though? Like you have a moment where you realize where you are because it's not where you used to be. For some folks, that means a lot. You know, for some of us, we grew up in places where you couldn't really look up or in around. Like, you had to always be looking who was around you. And you didn't have time to really spend time appreciating the landscape. Um, I want to say, first and foremost, thank you all so much for, for inviting me to be here. Um, it, it's always a great honor for people to, to trust me with a space, especially a space like this. You know, you don't walk into a space and look at the faces that are around. Like, look around right now. Just look around right now. Just take a look around. Look who's in the space. Realize that we're in a college campus. Look that there's no walls. There's windows where you can see what's going on in the outside world. There's African art. Hopefully it was by a student, and if it wasn't by a student, it was by an amazing artist, because that's, that's a, I want that in my living room. Probably doesn't even fit in my living room, but that looks beautiful. Um, so this is what I want to do. I know I have 20 minutes. By now I have like 18 minutes. So I need somebody to help me out, because whenever I feel the drum, I go to a different place. Right? Sometimes the drums makes me go somewhere else, and I'll tell you why. Um, so I need somebody to keep track of time for me. Um, if anybody has a watch or something, does anybody want to nominate? Yeah, in the back? Okay. Can you flag me when I'm at 10 minutes and then when I got five minutes left? Just for, okay, thank you so much. Okay, y'all. So, so, so let's get started. Um, my name is Ruben, and I am here to share a little bit of my story with you all. I'm here to reflect a little bit about the legacy of Cesar Chavez. I want to reflect a little bit about what that means in me being a first generation college student, especially being a college student uh, from a family that had college experience before, but not in the US. What does that mean? And what does it mean for me to be doing work that growing up my family didn't see me doing? And what was that conversation like when you have to tell your mom, hey, maybe I'm not gonna be a lawyer. And that's a tough conversation to have. So I wanna, I wanna go through that, right? I wanna start today by saying, 
it has been very uh, painful for me to have heard in the last couple of weeks, ever since the Cesar Chavez movie came out. How many of you already watched that movie? Yeah, a couple of you, okay. So um, my grandmother had a restaurant in the Coachella Valley. Every first of the month, uh, Cesar Chavez and his leaders would come to her restaurant and eat a caldo called Siete Mares. Brother loved his seafood. My grandma had the best seafood in the area, so they would come. He wouldn't come alone. He would come with his trusted allies and friends and colleagues. And what I need to share with y'all today is that they were not all Latino. They were not all from the US. Some of them were immigrants. Believe it or not, there was Filipinos in the field out there with Cesar Chavez. Believe it or not, there was Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Hmong, Lao, Latinos from all across Latino America, not just Mexican and not just people born in the US. The beauty of the UFW is that it was able to create a message and a togetherness and a unity that brought all of these different people from different walks of life to come together. And that's what happened. I've heard that in the movie, I haven't watched it, but in the movie, a little bit of historical erasure happened where the presence of our Filipino, Vietnamese, Hmong, Lao, African-Americans, brothers and sisters that joined the cause and Caucasian uh, communities that came together for that wasn't necessarily shown in the film. So I wanted to make sure that if somebody's going to speak on that, that I could join and be part of those voices that says it was a collective group coming together. I wanted to start off with that. So now let me tell you who I am. I come from very different and at the very similar time, very similar families. On my father's side, we were braceros. Everybody familiar with the bracero program? Immigrants from all across uh, Mexico and Latin America were brought into the US because the US decided to cut off a lot of the natural waters that went into Mexico and it killed off the land in the Mexican region and then said, come and work the fields for us and we'll give you workers permits and you can be farm workers here. That was my grandfather from my father's side. So that's what they did. They started in Chihuahua, Mexico and then they went to Texas to Arizona, to New Mexico, so on and so forth, wrote the whole border and ended up in the Coachella Valley. So I come from a farm working family. On the other side of my family, I come from indigenous um, family members. My mother was the youngest of 11. She grew up in a mountain in Chihuahua and she's Raramuri. Grew up with no running water, no electricity, nothing. All you had was love, passion, work ethic, and hunger. Does that make sense? in that order. Love always first, hunger always last, because people gotta eat. Um, so that's my background. Now, why does that matter? One of my biggest conversations that I always have, and I've been doing this for quite some time, is that sometimes I look into the audience, right? And when they're hearing me say where my family's from, sometimes I hear, I see blank faces, and what I choose to believe is that they're thinking, damn, where's my family from? Do I know my family's story? Have I bothered to make that important for me to carry with me? Or have, been, or have I been too caught up with Facebook, Twitter, whatever people are using these days and, uh, and talking about pop culture? And I really don't even know who I am and where I come from. Am I allowing outer sources to dictate what should be my priority? And I'm, I'm always going after external sources, right? Sometimes I go to places where hunger is real, poverty is real, struggle is real. But when I look into the audience, I see like fresh Nikes and Jordans and like fitted people. And I'm like, whoa, where's that coming from? Because I know me growing up, I was getting hand-me-downs and I was hella juiced for those hand-me-downs. I was like, yes, a shirt without holes, you feel me? You know, it was like, damn, my foot's getting bigger. Yo, dad, let me borrow your Nike so I can go run. Hey, cousin, you see what I'm saying? Like that kind of environment. So that lets me know there's something going on. I get excited. Because if you're in a community like that, and there's Jordans in the audience, and there's expensive stuff in the audience, that means that there's drive. That means that there's work ethic. That means that there's perseverance. The difference is, is that priorities are messed up, but I don't get caught up in that because I can get, that's two conversations that need to happen and they're ready to go somewhere else. Y'all follow? Yeah. Okay, so now, 
my community. I come from a border community. I grew up in Mexico. We were in Mexico first because my father was a martial artist. My father was the captain of the National Mexican Karate Team. So I grew up in dojos. I grew up in the karate world. My mother was a psychologist. Remember I told you she grew up in the mountains? She came down to the city because my grandfather said, we're going to be the first family to leave the village, get educated in the Spanish tongue, learn from their books, learn their work, and then come back to the village and help around. Because a lot of external people are coming into a village and they're taking over the lands. And all of a sudden, things that have been sacred to us, people are coming chopping down to make a paper. Y'all follow? Good. Now, so that's what happened. My mother went from the mountains to the city, fought her way, worked her way. Because when you got 11 siblings, everybody's got to work. You feel me? Everybody got to put some money on the table to pay for rent. Because parents weren't doing that. They got to take care of each other. She ended up in UNAM, in Mexico City. UNAM is like the Berkeley of Mexico, of Latin America, right? Public, very like social justice driven, very research based, on and so forth. And that's where she went and she graduated. My father went there too, but my father decided to drop out of college. Remember I told you I was gonna be the first one that graduated from college in the US? That's what I was talking about. My mother graduated from a college, she graduated in Mexico. My father went to college, but dropped out. He wanted to be a lawyer. But in his third year, you have to do an internship. And in that internship, he started traveling with lawyers. He started seeing that more business got done in strip clubs than in courtrooms. And he said, that's not for me. That's not the type of environment that I need my family growing up in. That's not the type of things that I need in my mind and in my consciousness for me to say, this is how I'm making my money in strip clubs and so on and so forth. Whoever makes their money there, no judgments. That just wasn't for him. So he decided to leave. And he went into martial arts full time. At that time, he got lucky, right? Bruce Lee was like the man of the world. Everybody was trying to do martial arts at that time. I was like, damn, you know, everybody was like, why? And like all that stuff, like <laughs> just little kids everywhere. Everybody wanted to be Bruce Lee, which is beautiful. Imagine that thought. Everybody wanted to be a five foot three Asian man. <laughs> Think about that, okay? Not any Asian man, but a man that had mastered multiple martial arts and was making a living out of it, coming out in movies that people didn't even want to fund. And then they came out and everybody was there. That's deep in it himself. I love Bruce Lee, by the way, if you can't tell. Um, so my father went into martial arts. My mother went into psychology. Then something interesting happened. They had a family. I came out some time after. You know, it takes time to make a baby. I came out, and then we started working hard as a family, right? My father kept competing, then he retired, then he opened up his own dojo. Now, this is where it gets interesting. As I started growing up, and we were in a border town, I started realizing that conversations get, started getting a little bit more tense because all of a sudden my mom couldn't go into, into the U.S. anymore and we couldn't go visit our family. And that's when I started asking questions. How come we can't go to the U.S. no more with mom? How come mom has to stay in Mexico? And my dad was like, well, you were born in the U.S. Your sister was born in the U.S. I have my, work, I have my residency because of the Bracero program, whatever that was, I was like five. Um, and your mommy doesn't, so she can't come with us. And that sucked to me. I was like, that is unfair. That's not fair. What do we need to do? Lesson number one, since I was very little, whenever I would hear an issue, it was always, what do we need to do? I never accepted conditions as they were. I always saw myself as being able to do something about them. Y'all follow? Right? Somebody would fall. I wouldn't be like, ah, you fell. You know, kids are punks like that. I would always go and be like, you okay? Do you need anything? Do you want me to walk you to the nurse? For whatever reason. Probably from martial arts, right? Anyways, so come middle school time, I started getting a little bit better at martial arts. So the coach from the USA team came to my family and said, hey, your son should be in the US so that he can get a, a scholarship to go to college in the future. That's what happened. Remember what I told you about my mom? So we went to get a worker's permit, right? Because my mom has her degree, she's working, she was doing incredibly well, and they said no. You can't get a worker's permit, and if we start the processes, it's gonna take about 10 to 15 years for you to be able to come into the US legally and then go about your business. Y'all follow? At that time, I was in middle school. Did I have 10 to 15 years? No, you gotta go to school. I wish that would have been awesome. No, I gotta go to school. So we came to the US and my mom became undocumented because she wanted to make sure that her son and her daughter were able to pursue an education. So that's a little bit of our family history. I grew up in a mixed status family. Mom was undocumented, dad was a resident, and me and my younger sister were born in the US, so we were US citizens. Y'all follow? This is important for everything that's gonna happen. Now, now I wanna give you specific things from that reality that we had to do as a family to adapt and keep moving forward, okay? I knew 
that my mom couldn't work anymore because she was undocumented. I knew that. I knew that my father's job made him travel a lot. My dad traveled about six to eight months out of the year. And I knew that I was getting older. So my responsibilities were gonna be to start contributing to the family financially. Y'all follow? So my role became primary financial support for my family. I was working karate gyms. I was taking the classes because I was still competing myself while being a full-time high school student, doing the AVID, doing the football, doing the basketball and all that good stuff. Everybody there with me? So this is what my day would look like. I would wake up around five in the morning, go run, go work out, get my sister, walk her to her, to her elementary at that time. Um, then I would go to, uh, to school and then do my business, pick up my sister, bring her home, eat real quick, change, go to the border, get on the bus, go to the karate gym, give classes, take classes, close the gym around 12.30 at midnight, come back to the border, come back to the U.S. By the time I was home, it was about 1.30 in the morning, do homework from 1.30 to 3.30, 4.30, wake up the next day and do the same thing. That was seven years of my life. I didn't know any different. I didn't know that was, like, you're, some of you are like, damn, that sucks. I didn't know. All I knew was that I was taking care of my academics, was that I was doing things that I loved, which was avid football, basketball, which was I was bringing money home from the karate gyms, which I was getting to travel because I became part of the team, so I got to travel. That's all I knew. I didn't have no other realities to compare myself because I didn't have time to just chill with my friends and realize that everybody outside of school were just kicking it at home. You follow? So my reality became just our experience. Lesson number two. You dictate your reality. You have to own that, whatever that may be to you. And know that reality shifts and changes according to what you're acting upon. Summer times, my mom said, it's way more expensive for you to stay here than for you to go to some kind of summer camp because they'll take care of you and I don't got to worry about you and there's less cost in the family. So this is what we did. I went to some place called the library. They'll still exist at that time. I used something called the computer and then I became best friends with something called Google, right? So I told my librarian, my mom needs me to leave this summer, and that was kind of red flags there, probably shouldn't have said it that way. My mom needs me to not be here this summer. I need to find a summer program that I can go to. What kind of summer program do you want? I said, law, I really want to be a lawyer. Why do you want to be a lawyer? Because too many people are crying around me. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, every time that we go to a lawyer's office, my mom always comes out crying. People in the waiting room are crying because they're saying that the lawyer isn't helping them. I don't know what a lawyer does, but I need to become a lawyer to make people smile. <laughs> That's point blank period how I became a lawyer in my mind, right? I was like, I'm trying to get these people to stop crying so much, right? I see people from all across. It was like Mexicans, Guatemalans, Hondurans, black folks, immigrants from like Jamaica, Ethiopia, so on and so forth. Um, Southeast Asians, so all, of, all of these people were just crying because of this lawyer. So I was like, damn, I got to be a lawyer. So that's what I did. Even though nobody was doing that in my friends or anything like that, that's what I did. I found programs in the summer. And once I found it, I realized that those programs cost anywhere between four to $10,000. You think my family had four to $10,000? Hell no. So this is what I had to do. I had to hustle. Lesson number three, you get what you hustle for. What did that mean? I saw six to $10,000. That meant I knew how to wash cars. I knew how to mow lawns. I knew how to cook. I knew, I learned how to fold clothes. You'd be surprised how many people don't like to fold clothes and they'll give you money for that. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people don't like to iron their clothes and they give you money for that, right? I was like, hell yeah, shit. It's dope. I get to be indoors. I'm folding clothes. I'm getting paid. Good. So that's what I did, y'all. I went around my community knocking doors and say, hey, my name is Ruben. I'm trying to go to this summer program. The librarian printed it out for me and put in like this really nice, like transparent thing. And I was walking around every single house school trying to get money in that way. And then one day my mom said, why don't we go to a bank? Bank has money. I'm like, cool, let's go to the bank. Said to the bank, walk out of the bank with $6,000. Like, damn, we need to come to the bank more often. <laughs> and that's how I made things happen for myself and my family is that hustling mentality. Now, that happened. I didn't graduate from my high school with a high GPA. You know why? Because I didn't have time to study. You feel me? And my mom was okay with that. My sister was a 4.0 person. I wasn't. But I said, I still got to go to college because I got to be a lawyer. So I applied to colleges. I got into some colleges. And then I realized that there was something called scholarships. All of a sudden, the colleges were calling me and saying, hey, we didn't only admit you, but we want to interview you. So I was like, cool, interview me. What does that mean? 
So then they said, we just want to talk to you. Okay. So I got bussed out to LA, had a conversation, and this is the fourth point. They asked me to talk a little bit about how my racial identities impacted my trajectory. They did. I showed up to the interview, and after I shared my life story to somebody, one of the faculty, the faculty said, mind you, this is the first time that I ever meet a faculty person. Faculty people said, that's an incredibly impressive story. I've never heard anybody walk around a community to get money to go to a law program. I was like, shit, me either. <laughs> but I had needed to do something. He said, I love your drive. I love your persistence. I love your energy. I love what you're doing. But let me be honest with you. This is a $250,000 scholarship. If it goes to somebody like you that comes from a community like yours, statistically, people like you that come from a community like yours tend to drop out of college. I don't want to throw $250,000 down the trash. So I said, OK, so let me get this straight. You just heard my whole life story. You heard why I want to be a lawyer. You heard that my mom is waiting outside the room. And if I don't come out and tell that I got the scholarship, I'm going to get my ass beat. <laughs> and you just told me that you think I'm going to drop out of college. That's not an option, sir. I got no other option. I'm about to go into this college. I don't care where it is and what I got to do, but I'm about to graduate because my mama needs to become a citizen because I'm tired of hearing my mom cry in the middle of the night. So either give me the scholarship or I go to another school, get that degree, come find you, and slap that degree in your face <laughs> because I'm going to graduate from a college, right? And that, and that got a little bit crazy. Yeah. So now... This is what I want to share with you. I need you to know a little bit about my story. And this is not the first time that we're going to meet y'all. This is just the time that I'm sharing my story with you. I'm going to stick around, and I would love to meet with y'all one-on-one and, and talk a little bit more. I hate it when people would speak and wouldn't share anything about them. That does nothing for me. Because most of the time that I grew up hearing how to speak didn't look like me, didn't talk like me, didn't have similar experiences, at least the ones that I knew. So I need you to know who I am and what I've been through so that you know that I serve as a mirror to your greatness. You need to hear that you got greatness within you. You need to know that you can create your reality. I come from the hood, y'all. I come from the border. Now you see me in a suit. You know how many suits I wore growing up? Zero, right? Cool, cool. So coming into college, this is what I need y'all to know from the college hustle. People think that because you're in a new environment that everything changes. No, you develop but nothing changes. You still have your hustling abilities. How many of you are the type of person that if you get into a conversation with somebody, nine out of 10 times you're gonna get your way? Be honest, okay? Yes, thank you, smiles, yes. You know, you know that you're that type of person. Hey mom, can I go out? No, you can why not? It don't matter, you know you're going. All right, cool, I'll see you tomorrow. And you still go. You're like, how did that happen, right? Or like, you wake up one day and you're like running through your entire day, right? You're like, okay, it's six o'clock in the morning right now. I got to do this, this, and this, and that. Wait, no, I can't do it that way. I got to do this, 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 and that. And that's how I'm going to do it. And something's going to go wrong, but that's okay. We'll figure it out. And then you map up the whole day and you go about the day and then nothing works out. But you were like, it was a good day. You feel me? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. And the last thing is this. How many of you all know that sometimes you can start in a place where you know nothing about, but something happens. And by the end of the day, you learn something and you're like, oh, shit, I didn't know that when I woke up, but now I do. Right? Okay. It's the same thing in every other aspect in life, y'all. It's just that when you go to college, they tell you, you need to be a critical thinker. And they call it something really fancy. They give, they give you some theoretical paradigmical shift of the human existence and the brain and the brain functions and how that pursues your hand. And all you're saying is like, dude, all you said was that I got to think twice before I act. <laughs> Do you know my mom? I got to think four times. <laughs> twice as me, twice as her, and then I'll act. I've been doing that since I grew up. You feel me? Then they say, you got to be a strategic thinker. You can't just get a problem and spit out an answer. You got to think about all angles again. Do you know where I come from? Do you think I can just walk from point A to point B without thinking all of the different things that I got to think about to get there and how many responsibilities I got to make things happen? All of the skills and the abilities that you need in order to succeed, you all already have. I'm telling you that right now. That's one of the biggest things that for some reason we're not being told because of the communities that we come from. The only thing that y'all are missing is information that isn't available from where you come from. That is all. 
That's why you're gonna go to college, to get that information. But the hustling, the belief, the love, the creativity, you have that. Y'all feel me? And we know that sometimes it takes for us to go through things multiple times, just like it does when you're cooking. How many of you like food? Just raise your hand if you like food. How many of you like food? Be honest. All right, some of you are not raising your hand and you know damn well you like food. Okay, <laughs> put your hands down, okay? I know what a quesadilla is. Everybody know what a quesadilla is in this room? All right, it's probably one of the most simple things that you can possibly cook in the world. To this day, I've been cooking quesadillas for like 20 years of my life. Not one will taste like my mom's. Not one. And I'm like, yo, it's a tortilla and it's cheese. <laughs> How does she make that taste so good? And I do that. I'll, I'll be watching her straight up. I'll be like, okay, okay, okay. Fuck. What? What do you do? What are you doing different to the tortilla and to the cheese that it makes it feel so good? Notice what I just said. Feel so good. Not just taste so good. Y'all know that home cooking feeling? Like when it goes into your stomach and your spirit all of a sudden feels like you're ready to do whatever it is that you want to do. It don't even matter. It could be like a day full of chores, but after you had that like, you know, that lumpia, that menudo, that taco, that like soul food, you're like, damn. No matter what happens today, it's going to be a good day because my belly's full. That's what I'm talking about. This is, when I leave you, this is what I want to leave you all with, okay? Yes, we come from people and communities that are experiencing struggle. There's no way to avoid that. Y'all feel me? Some of you throughout this conversation have gotten like teary-eyed, you're smiling, you're paying attention where in the beginning you weren't. That's beautiful, thank you for arriving. And we don't only experience struggle. It doesn't always have to be an oppression Olympic between us. Well, black people have it that way and Latinos have it that way. Well, it's because Southeast Asians have that and Latinos don't have that. Well, it's because white people, that's oppression Olympics. When you're getting cut up on the problems and nobody's saying, hey, so what do we do about it? Yes, everybody's hungry. So what do it look like for the community to come together and put a farmer's market together? What does that look like? Is that an option for us? No, it's not. We don't have farms. That's okay. There's businesses around here. What if we ask for donations? People that don't have food can all of a sudden have food for free on Sundays. And we'll donate our work hours and all of a sudden people are eating on Sundays. Boom, hunger's done. You feel me? That's the type of thinking that I would want us to embrace because that's the type of thinking that created the UFW. Somebody at some point said, are people being treated the way that they're being treated in the farms is not the way that human beings should be treated. Did you hear that? Somebody said women getting raped in the fields should not be a common practice. Somebody said us getting paid the way that we're not getting paid should not be happening. And it's a lot better for us to come together than for me to do it alone. Because alone, I'm one. One close fist goes so far. Two joined hands can do a lot more. You know what I'm talking about? That's what I want to share with you all. Listen, I went to Berkeley. That doesn't mean that everything was perfect. I almost dropped out of college like three times. I'm comfortable saying that with you all. It's tough. The academic rigor is beyond what you can imagine. And that's why we need to be there. We don't come from places where struggle doesn't exist. So when we see struggle, we run away. If I struggle, that means I'm doing shit right. If I'm burning my hands with that tortilla, that means I'm getting closer to my mom because my mom can touch that fire and she doesn't even move. And I'm like, damn. You're like massaging the oil on the pan. I'm like, what the? Who does that? Who does that? Do you know what I'm talking? You know what I'm talking about, though. After a while, you burn it. That shit feels like home. You touch the comal and you're like, it's not ready. Instead of like hovering above, that's what I do. I'm like, no, it's not ready. My mom's like, no, está listo. And she'll and she'll go like iron wash and then come back and, no, está listo. I'm like, yo, your hand is warm from the iron. Most likely, you're not even feeling the difference. Anyways, that's a separate conversation with my mom. We don't run away from struggle. 
If somebody thinks in here that going to college is going to be too much of a struggle, you're right. And if somebody here thinks it's going to be too much of a struggle and I cannot do it, come talk to me. I almost dropped out of college three times. Remember I told you all? Every single time that I stopped myself from dropping out was because I had to play in my mind everything that my mother had to do for me to be there. Everything that my father had to do for me to be there. Everything that my grandparents had to do for me to be there. And if the only thing that I had to do was sit down and read a book and learn some new information and take a test, and that was my struggle, andas perdido. You're lost. You need to reconnect. You need to call home and be like, hey, mom, how was your Friday night? And hear what happened on Friday night. And realize that if nothing changes with you, the next Friday night is going to be the same. And your family doesn't deserve that. One lesson that my family grew up with was every generation has to be a little bit better than the one before. And that's what I'm going to leave you with today. Every generation has to do a little bit better than the one before. That means that if my parents graduated from college and then they had to go through a migration story and become undocumented so that I could get a piece of paper on my mom's kitchen that says University of Berkeley, double degrees, Ruben Elias Canelo Sanchez, and put her last name there because in America you only put the father's side, which is kind of effed up because it took two to tango. And even two, even more to raise a child, especially me, because I was a troublemaker growing up. If that's what she wanted, that's what she was going to get. I'm 25 years old. I graduated from Berkeley. I did my graduate work. My mom's a U.S. citizen. My father's a U.S. citizen. They're both no longer getting evicted from any place that they go to. They have a steady house because I'm helping them with those finances. My sister's a second year at UC San Diego on her way to medical school. I have a job that I absolutely love. Do you know what it feels like to wake up and you smile because you love what you're about to get yourself into? Man, some of you already feel that. Some of you can't wait to have that. Trust me, it's going to be one of the most special feelings in the world. I'm only missing three things, y'all. Four. My sister to graduate from medical school, for me to find a wife, for me to have kids, and for me to host every single weekend. Every single weekend, my house will be the house that everybody comes to for a barbecue and all of y'all are invited. Because growing up, I always wanted to have that, but I couldn't. You know why? Because we were undocumented. Family was in Mexico, family was in parts of the US, and family could never be together. Now I got family everywhere. So I want to leave you all with that. What are your goals? Know your goals. Know that goals come with struggle, but that you're ready to overcome that struggle because struggle is in your blood. It's in your DNA. You have that already. The only thing that's missing is for you to believe it. And not just believe when everything's going right. Believe it when it counts, when it's midterms, and you're hungry, and you're tired, and you're delirious. You don't even know what day it is. You don't even know what time it is. You don't even know how long you've been wearing the clothes that you're wearing, but all you know is they're starting to smell in a way that probably shouldn't be smelling anymore. <laughs> that's when you need to believe, because that's what gets you through. Thank you all so much for your time. Have a beautiful day. My question is, when you got into Berkeley, because that's the school that I'm interested in, yeah. like what clubs on campus do you look for for support? Oh, that's an excellent question. Yes. Um, thank you so much for that question. When I got into Berkeley, first and foremost, I had to, I had to uh, do a little bit of a conversation with my parents because it's really easy. Sticker shock is real. You know, do you all know what sticker shock is? No. It's like, yeah, you got into Berkeley and it's $35,000. You're like, whoa, how, what are we going to do that, right? So it's like, ah, está bien, mijo. Like, that's awesome. Congratulations. But how much does it cost? So that's the first conversation that I had to have with my family about cost. And until the scholarship came in, then we were like, okay, maybe we can make this happen. But if the scholarship didn't come in, I had already started having conversations with people at Berkeley to explain to me financial aid packages so I can make sense about my to my family. Remember I told you that growing up I had to contribute to my family? So I knew that if I went to college, I had to work and I had to keep sending money back home. So that's one of the questions that I asked them. Once I got into Berkeley, listen y'all, you need three people when you go to college, three people. 
This is key. Number one, you need the person that's gonna help you be academically strategic. You need, a, you need an academic advisor. Somebody that can trust and be like, hey, look, these, this is the major that I wanna do, this is why I wanna do it. I need you to tell me which professors to take, which professors not to take, when to take some classes, when not to take some classes, strategy. You know what I'm talking about? You need to be strategic. Just because the website says you have to do one, two, three, doesn't mean that you gotta do one, two, three. If it makes sense for you to do three, two, one, or three, one, two, you do what you gotta do. College is about your trajectory. There is no cookie crust way of how you get through college. Some people take the first two years, then they take off three to save money, and then they close out strong. That's doable. Some people start in a community college, and then they come back. Some people got pregnant in college, and it's like, damn, what do I do now? You stay. You have your baby, do what you got to do, and come back because there's resources for student parents at colleges. That doesn't mean that your life ends. That means that you have an extra physical motivation for you to get through college, right? That's the first person. The second person, somebody that's going to be with you every single step of the way to strategize professionally. What do you want to do when you graduate from college? You want to be a doctor? You need to have a mentor in that area. Maybe not a doctor, but you can have a recruitment specialist from the medical school that you want to go to and befriend them. Say, hey, you and me are going to become best friends because I'm going to John Hopkins. We are just a freshman in college. I don't care. I won't be just a freshman in college in five years, so you got to be ready for me. I'm helping you do your job because I know you need more black people there. I know you need more Latinos there. I know you need more Southeast Asians there. You see what I'm saying? You start that hustling mentality. And the third person that you need is somebody that you can check in with just personally. Sometimes, I'm going to be honest with y'all, academics wasn't the difficulty for me in college. The difficulty for me was personal. I'm super far from my mom. Every time that something goes wrong, I blame myself. Every, every time something goes wrong with my sister, I blame myself. And I needed somebody that was an elder, a mentor, that could tell me, hey, this is not your fault, and this is how we get through it. Does that make sense? Academic strategy, professional strategy, and personal support. Those would be the three areas that I would recommend to you all. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the question was, how do I get to the point that I found something that I, that, I, that I love? Remember how I told you growing up, I always said, like, I want to be a lawyer? That was a really tough conversation to have with my parents. Really tough. Because uh, remember I told you my dad dropped out. So we already had one drop off from law. So it was like, oh, my God, here we go again type of thing. So this is what happened for me. When I was an undergrad, the professional mentor and the life mentor that I had were really good with me. They said, you cannot leave college and declare something if you haven't worked in it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Some people are out here trying to be doctors and they've never been in a hospital. And they've never been in a clinic. They just watch House or Grey's Anatomy or some shit like that and they're like, oh my God, you know, I wanna do that. Blood looks awesome, you know? And then they see blood for the first time and it's not even theirs and they're like, ay, my knees, right? No. Then there's other people that really, really want to go into business. They just say, I want to be a business major. And then you ask them, why? What about business do you like? I don't know. I just want to make money. Okay, but what in business do you want to do? Do you want to start a business? Do you want to do finances? Do you want to do personal equity strategy? So on and so forth. So for me was, I needed to do, I needed to get involved in the spaces that I wanted to do working to see how I felt. I was in a law firm, and it was a social justice driven law firm. But once I started studying, higher education research and theory, and I started realizing how much I had a lot of ideas for that field and how to change it. Like for example, I'm one of the co-founders of the undocumented student program at Berkeley, right? That had never existed before at Berkeley or in a lot of universities. It was like, we can't work with undocumented students, that's illegal. No, it's not because X, Y, and Z, but I did my research. But my research background allowed to do that. And then the California Dream Act passed and then we said, we gotta go full out. And it should be undocumented students. It shouldn't be Latino Immigrant Student Center. You catch that? Because it's really easy to get caught up in the West Coast with all things Latinos and all things Mexican. That's not the case. For me, it was like, how do I create a center where everybody feels welcome? Because believe it or not, there's people who are undocumented that are not Latino. 
We have over 22 different countries represented in our undocumented student program. That's just Berkeley, y'all. Now we're about to go through the entire UC system. So that's how you find what you want to do, because you got to do it. Put yourself in those spaces. And sometimes you're going to get the side eye. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, what is this youngin doing here? Or what is this person doing here? Side eyes is my Friday night with my family. OK? Like, I don't know, drama, you know, microaggressions, like burning, shit talking, all that stuff. I get that every day from my family. Why would I care about getting that from a professional space? But eventually, it started earning my, my trust. Right? Eventually, it started saying, OK, maybe this guy really is serious about what he's doing, because I was. And then they started respecting me, and they started giving me projects to do. Everybody's got to earn their keeps. You know what I'm saying? Even people, I could tell you right now, people who have PhDs, who have had their PhD for five years, that still can't find a job. You know what I'm talking about? Because they don't have that hustle mentality. They don't have that hustle mentality to make things happen for themselves. They want things to be done for them. Well, it's because I got a PhD. People should be coming after me. No, boo-boo. <laughs> Ain't nobody coming for you. You got to show up and say, hey, I got a PhD, and this is what I want to do, and this is how I can make it happen in your university. And if you don't hire me, I'm going to go to another university, and they're going to hire me. So just hire me right now. <laughs> it's that hustle mentality, right? Yeah. One more question? Yeah, please. Um, if you can find the chance to get to a point where you want to transfer or anything and you're not really for sure how to go about um, possibly something that you might want to or you change your mind, yeah. how would you be the support system that you need to maybe take um, the elective classes? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So. I think studies show that on average, undergraduates change their minds about six times when they go to college, right? So that's normal. It's absolutely normal. The thing is, prior, I don't, I don't know if you were here prior, but I said we, you need to have three key people in your, in, throughout your studies, right? So you have your academic, your professional, and then your life support, right? If you want to change your mind before you change your mind, know what you're getting into. I have some students that will say, cold turkey, I don't want to do pre-med no more. I'm going to law from one day to the next. I'm like, damn, I love the energy. I love the passion. Show me the research that you did to make that decision. What did you do? Who did you talk to? Well, it's because I talked to my friend, or I talked to my girlfriend, or I talked to my boyfriend. How old is your boyfriend, girlfriend? How old is your friend? What degrees do they have? How long have they been doing this work? How did they mentor you through? Did they ask you this and this and this and this? And did you go to this, this and that? No. Go. OK. And then they go. You see what I'm saying? And there's different ways to do that. Listen, y'all. Oh, the hustling that I'm talking about, when I went to Berkeley and I realized that I wanted to do higher ed research, there is no major at Berkeley on that. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Graduate School of Education only takes graduate students. So you know what I did? In my sophomore year, I did a research program on higher education research. I went to the Graduate School of Education. I went to the Graduate School of Public Policy. I went to the Graduate School of Ethnic Studies. I said, hey, read my, read my dissertation. That's what I told them. This, this is my dissertation. And I look older than I am, too. And I can sound older than I am. And when I dress up, you think that I'm like 40, which is beautiful. <laughs> so when I told them that, they were like, hey, why aren't you in our school? I'm like, you tell me. I should be taking some classes here. You feel me? And they're like, yes, I agree. Phenomenal work. And I'm, that's what I'm trying to tell my other program. So I, how, do we, how, how about I take one class in graduate school of ed, one school of public policy, one school of ethnic studies as a junior undergraduate? My last three years in, in, in Berkeley, y'all, I did all graduate work. And I went from flunking my first year to flunking my second year to finding my passion and saying, I want to do this all the time. You know when you're passionate about something because you just can't stop doing it. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like when you find your partner, like your romantic partner, like you've been holding hands for like six hours and you don't care, like it just feels that good type of thing. That's, that's when you know your academic realm that you can't stop reading. And you read something and you're like, whoa, who's that? And then you go find that other article. And then the article introduces you to somebody else. And then all of a sudden you find out Ansaldua and then you're done. Oh my God, once you find Ansaldua, then everything makes sense. Your world makes sense. So that's what I did. I hustled them. I had to lie a little bit. But if I lie to my mama, I can lie to anybody. You know? Yeah, I saw two hands. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I already answered? OK. Yeah. How do you find that passion here? Like, if you want to have that passion, you transfer. 
Yeah, you make it happen. I would show up to businesses, straight up. I, I wasn't going to the career center. I didn't even know that existed. Look, in my community, there's no career centers. You know what I'm saying? In my community, there's no counselors. I didn't know what that was. So I, I, so I said, okay, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a lawyer that does social justice. I went to my best friend, Google. That's my homie right there. I went Google Bay Area social justice law firms, and then I found them. And then one weekend, I just went on BART and visited all of those places. And I went and introduced myself. Hey, I'm Ruben. I'm about to graduate Berkeley, which was a lie. I was a freshman. Um, I need an internship. You know, I need an internship. I want to get involved with this. I, I believe in you. Let me get up in here. You know, you, what you need, coffee, copies, whatever. And, and, I, and that's how I did it. And y'all, have you ever uh, uh, watched uh, Matt Damon's movie with Robin Williams? You know what I'm talking about? What's it called? Damn. What? Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, remember he was a janitor. He could have been a janitor anywhere. This one went to one of the best schools in the country to be a janitor. Because you'd be, you'd be you know, moppy and you're listening to the lecture. You're like, oh, okay, I'm learning. That's what I would do. I started getting involved in different spaces, getting to know different people and befriending them. Going up to them and say, hey, let me introduce myself. My name is Ruben. I'm Mexican. My mom's undocumented. I need to fix her papers. I need to become a lawyer. What do I need to do? That was, that was, that was my, my selling point. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't care if they were like, oh, your mom, what? Your mom is what? Get out of here. No, you can't kick me out because I, I was born in the U.S. I said, my mom, not me. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? So it's that, look, you got to bring that love and that energy. Not everything has to be so heavy. Some people get caught up on how heavy things are. I don't. I choose to b live in a world that is not here yet. And I'm trying to get this world to catch up to that world, which is a world there where my mom's un not undocumented. My sister's a doctor and all that stuff. I'm married with kids and I'm happy, you know, because some people are married with kids and have a job and they're not happy. That's not me. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about. Cool moves that I can show you? <laughs> Absolutely. Not in a suit. Not in a suit. Yeah. No, but, uh, the, but in, in, in all seriousness, I think uh, a lot of what I learned in martial arts specifically has completely transferred to something else. And that, that's something that I want to share with y'all. All the danzantes here, you know, danza does something to your spirit. Danza does something to your soul. The music does something to you. There's going to be moments where you're going to need to trigger that energy. Do it. Go to a restroom and just start fucking stomping. <laughs> start dancing. Start, start feeling the drum in you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know I got a hype mix. Like, this Thursday, I have a huge meeting. It's like, Huge, huge, huge. I already got my play playlist for that morning. From the second that I wake up on Thursday, I have like a 45 minute playlist because music drives me. Like I got Little Richard. You, have you ever woken up to Little Richard by any way? <laughs> Damn, you get so much energy. Like you just hear like a wah, wah, blue. You're like, oh shit, let's go. <laughs> you know, like the piano, the music, like jazz, reggaeton, like banda, bachata, everything is there. Because I got to show up with all of my people. It can get lonely sometimes, y'all. It can get real lonely in the places that we're getting ourselves into. But with music and with relationships and all that stuff, every time that you show up, you're not showing up alone. I know that when I open up that door to that office that I'm going to be in, which is a very unique place, right, which is like the chancellor's building, right, and it just feels different, when I walk in there, I'm going to bring the energy. I'm not expecting that space to energize me because they don't know what I'm trying to do. But with that music, with the lessons that I learned, like for example, I feel always at peace in front of people. You know why? Because I competed in front of stadiums of people. Right now I'm just talking. I'm used to getting my butt beat in front of people. You know how embarrassing that is? <laughs> this is nothing. I'm just sharing with y'all things that everybody should know. See what I'm saying? It transfers. That confidence that I have that I can protect myself. Sometimes, I'm not going to lie, I'll be in meetings and somebody really irks me. And I'm trying to be patient, and I'm being hella empathetic, and I'm going through like my counseling protocol and like all this stuff. And and by point by player, they're just really racist or they're just really classist. You're not gonna change them. So in my mind, I'm like trying to go choking them, and it's awesome. You know, in my mind, I'm like, oh, go go plat, boom, and I'm like, and then I smile and I'm like, back to the meeting. I got that out of the way. You see what I'm saying? And sometimes I've had to tell people, hey, we can settle this outside. Let's talk it out outside. But they take it differently because I'm a person of color and because I'm a male. That's on them, not on me. Rather like, whoa, 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 no, that's not what I meant. I'm like, I know what you meant. I don't want to talk about how you're being a racist right now in front of your colleagues. And then it changes the dynamics. See what I'm saying?
is that kind of stuff. But I can teach you karate if you want. My senior year when I was applying to PhD programs, my closest cousin, Mike, passed away from leukemia within two months. Boom, done. One day he called me, he's like, hey, I peed out blood. And I'm like, that's not normal, go to the doctor. He's like, no, I'm cool. If I pee tomorrow, I'll go to the doctor. Health and men of color is definitely one of my biggest passions, okay? And just our communities in general. Just, if there's any doctors here and you need to get connected, please let me know, we gotta make that happen. Anyways, he peed out blood. The next day he peed out blood again. Then the next day he peed out blood and get okay, say, you're not getting off the phone with me until you get to that clinic and we get in fear of what's going on. Sure enough, he had cancer. Stage four, done. Two months he was gone. That was senior year, in the middle of applications, in the middle of finals, everything was going on. And that was going on at the same time. My mind was everywhere except where it needed to be. You see what I'm saying? So I had to make a choice. Either I allowed for what was going on to serve as a motivating factor for me, a recommitment of mine to push even harder and move forward, or I was going to allow it to disable me and then add more negative energy to already ridiculously painful situation for my family. Because I had to be part of the conversations via Skype, because remember, my family's in Mexico, and I was seeing everybody crying. I didn't need them to hear, this is impacting me so much that I'm about to flunk out of college. Do you see what I'm saying? So I had to have a conversation, and I spoke with Mike, even though he passed. I sat down and I went and, and I just had a conversation with him. I'm very big, I'm very spiritual. So I said, Mike, let's talk. What happened? How, how did you just pass like that? And I had my full on conversation. It's funny how the people that have impacted you the most, you already have their spirits and their voices in you. I had a full on conversation with Mike and he said, dude, if you fail, I'm gonna beat your ass when you go to sleep. And I'm going to tell my mom that you failed because you wanted to fail, not because I passed. What does that have to do? You're in Berkeley. You're in Berkeley. Graduate. Make a difference. And then when you have your firstborn, name him Mike. So the first conversation I'm going to have when my future wife, wherever that may be, be like, hey, how do you feel about kids? Good, good. Our first one's going to be called Mike. And if she smiles, she says like, okay, without even asking me questions, I'm getting married on the spot. <laughs> and she's like, why Mike? Why Mike? I'll be like, okay, maybe a second date. And she's like, no, I hate that name, bye. <laughs> she see what I'm saying? So you, you have to, in those moments of extreme like tension, challenge, there's people that grow in that moment and there's people that get crushed in that moment. It's in, in our DNAs to grow. We've been through it, y'all. We've been through slavery, we've been through rape, we've been through malpractices, medically, socially, we've been through everything. That's in our coded DNA. You don't have struggle in your DNA, you have love and resiliency in your DNA. So let struggle come, bring you deeper lessons, and then create goals out of them. Like my goal is that my first child is gonna be my, you know? And everybody knows in the family, everybody knows that. When I said that to my auntie, I said that in his you know, funeral services, and everybody just started laughing. Because I was like, I know I'm gonna have eight kids, but at least the first one's gonna be called Mike, right? I'm not gonna have eight kids, obviously. I'm not a woman, one. Two, I don't get to choose that. My wife's body gets to choose that. However many she wants to have, that's what we're gonna have. And if we can't have any, we're gonna adopt. And I hope that child's okay with me calling him Mike. <laughs> Look, y'all. I have a very awkward relationship with English. I think it's probably one of the worst languages in the world. Um, yeah, you know, and because I don't know, English doesn't let me fully. Yeah, like you can't feel English. Like you have to feel energy for it to for the language to fully feel what it needs to feel, right? Like sometimes I'll be talking in Spanish, and I'm like, damn, that sounded a lot deeper than I thought it was gonna sound. <laughs> That's what the language did. Um, but if you're uh, only an English speaker versus being a multilingual speaker, you're still you. Sometimes for folks, it's not even the language the issue, it's their own personal politics that you don't wanna be laughed at, right? Ego comes into play, 
right? Like, I, I, I want to sound how everybody around sounds. You're not supposed to sound how everybody around sounds you. You're not. You're not supposed to communicate how everybody around you communicates. Look, y'all, right now I'm giving, like, a keynote speech, right? I probably cussed more than my mom would have allowed me, like, 10 minutes ago, right? But that's who I am. I, can, I bring myself to the work that I do. I want you to bring yourself to the work that you do. I have, I have faculty. I kid you not. I love them to death. But I don't know what the hell they're saying. And they're speaking English. <laughs> and then I have faculty who are from, like, Russia, Germany, Mexico, uh, just different tongues, right? And they have a really, really heavy accent, and it's really, really beautiful. I love difference. So if you have an accent, I love that, right? And I can understand word for word. And they're talking heavy theory. And I can understand that. You know why? Because they speak a language of humanity. They're saying, look, this is this really complicated theory. But basically what it's saying is that, let's say that you have a sprinkler, the projection of the water, and then they start talking about that. So now I'm thinking about a sprinkler instead of this like impossible physics problem that I can't comprehend. Now I'm thinking about the sprinkler. You see what I'm saying? So the way that I motivate students is like, what do you want to do? In the profession that you want to do, your languages, be it one, two, three, four, are only going to make you that much better. And we need you to speak those languages. And we need you to take care of your languages. Like, that's one of my biggest struggles with my sister. My sister has never liked Spanish for whatever reason. And that's been really tough for my parents because they're Spanish speakers, right? Myself, too. Until she got to college and she started reading, like, Ansaldua, Chedi Moraga, stuff like that, she realized that it was OK for her to speak Spanglish and that it was a beautiful experience. So now, man, she's like, oh, she got out, right? I'm like, yo, dude, that word doesn't even make sense. But it's beautiful. You want to make up that word? Make up that word. Because I got to teach her that she can create stuff. And as a woman, and as a woman of color, in the STEM areas at UC San Diego, the struggle can get real. So she doesn't need from her brother to tell her, you don't sound right. She needs from her brother to say, that sounded beautiful. And I can't wait for you to be a doctor. And I can't wait for you to go and serve our communities and to be connected with them with the multiple languages, not just verbal, but physical. Because sometimes you need a doctor to just hug you and say, hey, good morning. Welcome. That's my sister. My sister's probably going to be kissing everybody. You know, that's how we are in my family. We just kiss. I'm sure if, if her hospital tells her, hey, you can't kiss patients, you'll be like, OK, on to the next one. You wanted me. Nobody else speaks Spanish in this place. You know what I'm saying? So bring that love. Bring your own languages. So the question was, um, if I didn't do so well academically in high school, what, what, what was my academic uh, transition like in college, right? And I told you all, I almost flunked like about three times in Berkeley. I flunked my college writing, not, not English R1A, but college writing, which is a preparatory course for people who don't speak the language fluently and don't write fluently. I flunked that course three times. And that was six units. So from my incoming summer year all the way to the summer going into my third year, I had more negative units than positive ones, right? Because I needed to learn how to communicate in the way that the institution deemed intelligent, which was not how I deemed it intelligent.